It begins with a fairly clear-cut issue of black and white, of sexuality, of rape. Then it becomes increasingly confused. The image of black men was that they were anxious at all times to... What's good, y'all? D.C. Alabama Prisoner Profiles. We back at y'all today with another one. First of all, I want to say I appreciate y'all. We rocking about 30 followers right now. Got about 35 hours of watch time. Road to 1K. We building. We working. Today, I'm be bringing y'all Mr. Haywood Patterson, one of the nine Scottsboro boys sentenced to death for the assault of two white women aboard a train in Alabama in the 1930s. Uh, this was a big case garnered national uh, media attention uh, around the country. Now, a little bit about his early life. Haywood Patterson was born in Elberton, Georgia in 1913, the son of a sharecropper who later moved to Chattanooga to take work as a steel worker. Patterson dropped out of school after third grade. He worked as a delivery boy for a little bit after he quit. Uh, by the age of 14, he was a veteran of riding the rails looking for work, uh, having ridden the rails from Ohio to Florida to Arkansas. Moving up closer to the incident, he was 18 when he hopped on an Alabama-bound freight train with his friends Eugene Williams, Roy, and Andy Wright. A fight is said to have started when a young white man stepped on the hand of one of the Scottsboro boys, and these were hobos according to the records. It was Patterson's hand that was stepped on by uh, while he was hanging on to the side of the tank car. The young white men were forced to exit the train. Enraged, they conjured a story of how the black men were at fault for the incident. By the time the train reached Paint Rock, Alabama, the Scottsboro boys were met with an angry mob and charged with assault. Now that's crazy. Alabama, 1930s, need I say anything less? That's why a lot, most of this information is going to come from news articles and African American History Museum uh, sites because I didn't want to bother reading the appeal on this because it was some BS. All right, now these are the alleged victims, Victoria Price and Ruby Bates, two white women who were also riding the freight train, faced charges of vagrancy and illegal sexual activity. In order to avoid these charges, they falsely accused the Scottsboro boys of rape. Mm. I mean, it just sounds like, you know, a story you've heard time and time and time again, whether or not they actually... Uh, worry intimate and she was on top Mr. B y'all remember that from uh, what's that I think that's coach that's coach Carter when he was over there playing the preps and he had caught him hitting the uh, rich white girl talking about she was on top boy you better bring your ass up out of that room here you talking about also the one in the top left looks like uh, the chick from Orange is the New Black not Pennsylvania uh, the other dope being the head that was cool with like the kitchen lady red that looked like she always had black eyes all the time and her hair was always a mess yeah her just regular females shawty y'all some regular females all right, so we're moving on up to trial. So these cases were tried in Scottsboro, Alabama. Only four of the young African-American men knew each other prior to this incident on the freight train. But as the trials drew increasingly regional and national attention, they became known as the Scottsboro Boys. It was Patterson viewed as the most guilty and the most defiant of the boys, so he can go over that uh, bullshit, who prosecutors chose as their first target. During cross-examination, Alabama Attorney General Thomas Knight Jr., the prosecuting attorney, said, you were tried in Scottsboro. Patterson declared, I was framed in Scottsboro. Knight replied, who told you to say that? Patterson responded, I told myself to say that. Here you talking about? So he had a couple different trials here. Uh, March 
1933, he was retried before Judge James Horton of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals with Samuel Leibowitz as lead defense attorney. That trial ended in a conviction and death sentence, but Judge Horton set aside the conviction. The next trial before William Callahan resulting in another death sentence. After a confusing series of filing deadlines was missed and Patterson lost his right of appeal, probably on part of his lawyer. Um, however, in their ruling on Norris v. Alabama, the United States Supreme Court recognized that the two cases were interrelated and strongly urged the lower courts look into the Patterson case again. So he was tried a four time and finally given uh, 75 years. All white juries, every trial, uh, the first trial they gave him a death sentence too, forgot to mention that. All right, moving on up to prison time. So Patterson, either awaiting trial or serving time, spent time in jail in prisons in Scottsboro, Decatur, Birmingham, Kilby, parentheses, the death house, and Atmore. Patterson entered jail illiterate, but within eight months was writing letters home, reading and challenging guards to name a state that he could not name the capital of. His favorite prison reading when he get his hands on it was the magazine True Detective. Patterson's smart, enterprising nature and his defiance helped him tolerate the tough conditions of the Alabama Department of Corrections. They say Patterson was prone to mood swings. One letter might be hopeful and upbeat, while the next he might be complaining of nightmares and restless moments. Prison life in Alabama was never easy, but sometimes were especially tough. One night, originally set for his own execution, Patterson watched and listened from his own 6x9 foot cell as another inmate was electrocuted in a nearby room at Kilby. Of the experience, Patterson said, if I live to be 100, I'll never forget it. Atmore Prison near Mobile was the hellhole of all hellholes. Atmore was filled with sadistic and even murderous guards, murderous inmates, rampant homosexual grapes, and venomous snakes. Snakes? What the f- Snakes? You hear about cockroaches and, and mice and shit, but you got snakes in the cell. Snakes on the plane, snakes in the cell. That shit was scary and movie. I ain't kept it. That he was driven to tempting fate by draping them over his shoulders or putting them inside his shirt. Oh, now nah, he's a crocodile. Huh? On occasion, the prison bookkeeper offered two other black inmates $50 to kill Patterson, but instead they warned him. In February 1941, he was stabbed 20 times, puncturing his lungs by an inmate paid uh, by a guard to kill him. Deprived of normal outlets for sex, Patterson became an aggressive homosexual with his own gal boy. What they call him boys, baby, a gal boy. He attacked another prisoner with a switchblade for having sex with his, quote, kid, switchblade. Street knives in there back then. He didn't try to take my gal boy away from me after that, quote, Nobody did. Another quote from him, I had faith in my knife. It had saved me many times. Patterson held a variety of jobs in prison. He swept floors, worked rice and cornfields. For some time, he ran an unofficial general store out of his cell, the Stobox. He's Stobox. Better have his shit. I already know. At Kilby, Patterson was responsible for carrying dead inmates out of the execution chamber. My, now, my lord. Now, my lord. So you carrying these folks out the chair, somebody finna be carrying you out the chair, you sent us to that crazy. Lord. Alright, now let's talk escapes. Y'all be behooved and flattered to know, I'm sure, that he managed two escapes. The first in April 1943 gave Patterson five days of freedom before he was returned to Atmore to face even harsher treatment from prison guards. No shit. The second escape occurred on July 17, 1947 when Patterson was working on a prison farm in Kilby. So those are pictures of Atmore and Kilby back in the 30s and 40s that I found on the net. It says he and a number of other inmates began running through tall rolls of corn, then out into the woods through snake-infested creeks, dead in snakes again. Cornered by three dogs, Patterson drowned two before scaring off the third. Damn, how gangsta is that? After a few close calls, Patterson made his way to Atlanta then Chattanooga, then in the home of his sister in Detroit. At age 39, or 36, Patterson was able to enjoy his first beer. And this is an excerpt from his book that he wrote called Scottsboro Boy after uh, he managed a successful escape. I made my mind up to go. I got several other convicts to see things the same way. I knew I didn't have a chance unless I used eight or nine of them for bait. It took a couple weeks to fix that. 
We came in off the farm and checked in for dinner on July 17th. I went straight to the laundry to get ready. I put the civilian suit on under my prison uniform. How you get a suit in that jam? That's crazy. I didn't tell the other guys about that. We were running thin rice at that time working in the rice field. That was about five miles from the main prison and maybe a quarter mile from the dog warden's house. The dog warden had three or four colored prisoners released to him. They helped him train the dogs to catch humans. All the day as we farmed, we could view the dog warden's house that kept fear in the guys' hearts. I know the dog warden's habits about dogs. Each evening when it got cool, they went on a sham race to train the dogs to catch prisoners. The dog warden would get on a horse and ride behind the dogs. The convicts ran behind the dogs. They could niggas run after the dogs, right? I knew what time they went off on these races. I told the officers when the dogs were in the woods on a sham race, that would give us a good gift to get away. The others, I mean. Someone would have to overtake them, tell them of a break, and bring them back. We worked until the sun was almost completely out of sight. We were somewhere on a river bottom. All in there was high corn. The dog warden had taken off with the hound, so I got all the boys together and said, let's go. We hit for the woods. Captain Nutley fired several shots. I didn't run very far down the corn, just out of sight. I told the others to get going and go fast. I had a kid with me. I wanted to hold him back with me. I needed him as a sacrifice. That's crazy, bro. Got right on out that gym. Drowned dogs got on out that gym. Made it up to Detroit. That's what's up. So his freedom was short-lived. For the next three years, Patterson lived underground. He rediscovered women, made contact with Scottsboro supporters. A cab took me to 1973 Sherman Street in Detroit, the home of my sister, Mazelle. My family rushed over, quote, he wrote to Scottsboro Boy, a book uh, he, helped, he wrote with the help of journalist Earl Conrad. The day after I got there, my sisters cooked a great home meal. The first good meal I had since I was a boy. I tasted beer for the first time. I was 36 years old when I had my first glass. Whit Dykes, an associate professor of history at Oakland University, said that because the black bottom community was largely composed of African Americans who operated their own institutions such as stores, homes of worship, and cultural institutions, Patterson would have been able to blend in. Quote, there were a large number of black businesses, black owned and black run drug stores, restaurants, nightclubs, and a concentration of churches of just about every denomination, many of them run by blacks, said Dykes. He would find something similar to Tennessee and that is a black community that was intact. He could blend into that community. He, at the urging of I.F. Stone, told his story in a book published in 1950, The Scottsboro Boy. Shortly after publication of this book, Patterson was arrested by the FBI. Alabama asked that Patterson be returned to Alabama, but Michigan Governor G. Menon Williams refused extradition after a nationwide letter-writing campaign was mounted on Patterson's behalf. And I think they had about to over 200,000 signatures. This is a big case at the time. You can say them folks all in front of the White House talking about stop the torture of them boys. You talking about? So, in December 1950, during a brawl at a Black Bottom bar, he reportedly was trying to sell a copy of his book when the incident occurred. Patterson was arrested in connection with the brawl that resulted in this man named Willie Mitchell and was charged with murder. Patterson claimed self-defense. His first trial resulted in a hung jury, second ended in a mistrial, and a third in a manslaughter conviction, and he was sentenced to six 15-year terms. Less than a year after Patterson returned to prison, on August 24, 1952, he was dead at cancer at the age of 39. God damn it. Man. So all that goes on over the next 80 years. Everybody will get pardoned except three of the boys until November 21st, 2013. The Alabama Board of Pardons and Paroles unanimously voted to posthumously pardon Charles Weems, Andy Wright, and Haywood Patterson. Three of the nine Scottsboro boys, a group of black teenagers who were charged in 1931, blah, 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 eight of the nine defendants, um including three who were recently pardoned were originally sentenced to death the racial injustice of the case sparked protests and two u.s supreme court decisions one because defendants didn't have adequate counsel and the other because no blacks on the jury right you can see in the picture of these courtrooms even the lawyers sitting there yucking it up like bro my life on the line bail i need you to be in here with the pit bull face i need i don't need you to be in here chopping it up with the judge's assistant the prosecutor talking about what your kids did. I need you to be focused on my case. Sit your ass down and read some notes or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Legislation passed in Alabama earlier this year that allowed the board to grant posthumous pardons in cases involving racial or social injustice. What the fuck did that do for people for real, bro? What does that do? 
The Pardon and Parole Board's Assistant Executive Director, Eddie Cook, said, Today, we're able to undo a black eye that has been held over Alabama for many years. Alabama Governor Robert G. Bentley said, The Scottsboro Boys have finally received uh, justice. Cap, 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 them folks done capped us down. Now, this is definitely a case of what I like to call the South don't care. You know what I'm saying? You got nine black kids, most of them teenagers on there. They ain't did that. They, everybody know they ain't did that. They still sent us these folks to death. They know them folks was lying back then like they knew that was lying on Emmett Till. You dig what I'm saying? It's really crazy. The South does not care. We didn't. We wanted to keep niggas in chains when the rest of the fucking country was looking at us like you. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's why people think we ride wagons and shit down here now. You hear our governor is on national TV. This bitch sounds like she has somebody chained up right now in her backyard. I swear to God, this bitch get on there. Well, uh, oh, the vaccine, it, bitch. Oh, my God. That's, you know what I'm saying? Like, just, you know what I'm saying? That's why the rest of the country, you know what I'm saying, just looks at this out as like a joke or something like that. It's, it's, it's crazy. Right? Then you end up going behind the wall in the 30s 40s and 50s you know what i'm saying as a teenager when you first get there and you gotta defend yourself and then what does that do to you eventually you you can't beat him jordan this man end up becoming a violent homosexual as they said what that mean that mean taking some that's what that means that means stabbing over boys and shit like that you know what i'm saying it's just crazy and as far as the Michigan uh, case he picked up after all this, where do you think he learned to stab somebody in prison? I don't think he, I honestly don't think he'd have been as predisposed to stab someone in self-defense if he hadn't done decades in prison for a crime he didn't commit, wouldn't you? But as my man Lockdown 88 says, you can't tell a man how to program. This has been Alabama Prisoner Profiles. Condolences to all parties. Uh, y'all know what's going on.